Welcome to Soaring the Sky, a Glider Pilots podcast. Hello, my name is Chuck. This is episode 33. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Soaring Incorporated, the nation's largest provider of professional glider training. Since 1969, they provided training from initial private through CFI Glider and entry level through advanced aerobatics. Open year-round, seven days a week. More information is available at azsoaring.com. On today's episode, we join Bob Rorter and Glenn Collins on location in the Appalachian Mountains at Mid-Atlantic Soaring. Bob is a person with disabilities and is learning to fly with a specially equipped glider that allows him to leave his wheelchair and soar to new heights. Glenn, his instructor, has taken on this adventure with him, teaching him how to fly. Join us now as we hear this amazing story and the possibilities others can have learning to fly with disabilities. Today I'm here with Glenn Collins and Bob Reuter. Bob is a person with a disability and he is able to fly gliders. So, as an instructor, Glenn, and Bob as the student, Glenn, you had to learn how to fly the glider with the hand controls, obviously, correct? Well, it wasn't absolutely necessary. Yeah, I've got full controls in the back seat. We're only putting the hand controls in the front seat uh, for Bob. But I wasn't about to do it, you know, without giving it a shot, just so I can relate to what I'm asking him to do. Now, many years ago, Bob started flying gliders uh, before the disability, but most of that's probably been forgotten, long-term memory. But he's been flying more recently with Freedom Rings and their Grobes with the hand controls. And then he came here to Mid-Atlantic Soaring when we bought the K-21s with one of them outfitted with the hand control. So he really hasn't known anything but the hand control, but I needed to kind of understand, you know, what he's doing. And it's, it's not quite intuitive to somebody who, you know, knows what I'll call the more normal way of flying, you know, using the rudder pedals. And so I, I wanted to experience it before I was willing to jump in there and do it full time with Bob. I'm probably about due to do a refresher. I haven't done it in about a year now. We've been flying, what, about a year? Year and a half. We've been flying a little better than that since about March of last year. Oh, yeah. actually, for January, we went up to 10 degrees. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, that flying with them was probably icing on the cake just to make it where I felt like I was more competent to work with Bob. Right. And so I did it. Now, you were part of Freedom Wings earlier. Now, for someone that doesn't know what Freedom Wings is, can you tell me about that? Freedom Wings is a club of disabled pilots. And it's uh, almost exclusively disabled pilots. There are a couple of, you know, there are some instructors and a couple of volunteers, but it's almost entirely disabled pilots. Someone that normally wouldn't know anything about it and had a disability and thought, well, I can't ever fly. That's not true. They, they actually could fly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't take it from me because I, the instructor probably says I can't fly, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm working on it. It's getting a little better. It's f having, uh, he's my ninth instructor in over 40 years and three different aircraft, so it's taken a little bit of getting used to um, him and the way he teaches. And none of none are bad, just different. Okay. And you're doing quite well. I mean, you're getting to the point where you can do everything you need to do. It's just, you know, string it together, you do it, you know, safely and consistently yeah and that's consistency is my big problem and this is a challenging airport to fly out of as you've seen in the past with some of the winds and all that that we mm -hmm. pick up and you know we're gonna make sure you're dead on before we let you go right absolutely yeah, if you, yeah I mean Van Sant where I flew before is almost like a piece of cake to land at it's a very easy airport to land yeah every airports different mm -hmm. how are the hand controls for you um, they work. They work um, fine. They're, you know, getting used to them. Uh, the rudder is very sensitive. Um, I tend to over, over, overwork the rudder because it's so sensitive. Um, and the exact opposite with the air brakes, they're very unsensitive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's sort of like a catch-22 here. <laughs> but um, they work. They work well. And once you get used to them, I don't know any other way of flying, so I mean, uh, it's the only way I know to fly, so it's, 
seems normal to me. Now you were showing me earlier, if you're in the cockpit, the rudder controls, which would be on the left side. They're on the left. And they'd be near the air brakes. Uh, just, um, just below and to the right of the air brake. So for, for me, just being used to the air brakes and having the rudders, you know, on the, on the pedals, on the floor, it would be very strange for mm -hmm. me to have to, you know, fly like that. Yeah. It, it would be very uh, different. First get to, used to it, sometimes you grab the wrong handle, but right. um, that doesn't take long to figure out which one's which. Right. <laughs> um, the, um, I call it the lollipop, but the um, rudder has this big round disc on it, which uh, makes it easy to, you know, and, and tactically it, find it. Yeah, and it's the most prominent of uh, the handles there. And right. I think that's what's led to the over-controlling on the rudder. So as you heard us talk before we just flew, we uh, we flew today without the hand control. Okay. We, we, uh, we actually used the other glider. We left the hand control out just to demonstrate the fact that the rudder is maybe not nearly as important as a lot of people think. You know, it counteracts the adverse yaw, but that only happens when you uh, got ailerons deflected. Yeah. You can fly, once you're established in the turn, your yaw string is even straight going yeah. around the turn. Yeah, probably that straighter than when I end. normally fly. <laughs> well, and, and Bob, it is straighter than when you would normally fly because you were riding the rudder. You had mm -hmm. your hand on it because it's so prominent and you can't help just the weight of your hand is going to move it. And so that's what I wanted you to see today and I think you saw it. Glenn, did you ever think you'd be instructing in a glider with the hand controls and helping out a person that's disabled? No, I, I actually didn't see it coming. You know, when we ordered the K-21s, you know, the way we had the club organized and everything, you know, we've got Walter Reed not too far away and all that. And a couple of us were talking one night and said, you know, they come with this option. Why don't we do one of them? And apparently the word spread. We hadn't even gotten the gliders yet, and Bob shows up. <laughs> Oh, nice. He'd gotten word we were getting them, and then they arrived in, what, November 17, and you joined probably... January 1st, January. officially, yeah. but I was here November 18. He was here the day we received them and put them together, wanting to know when he could fly, you know. And <laughs> so, you know, we got them in, we started getting people checked out in them, and, you know, right off the bat, I threw the hand controls in and flew with them. Nice. Definitely different. It took a while to get used to how to put them in. Uh, some of that wasn't always pleasant. We talked about earlier where we, you, know, you drop a piece and it go into the seat pan. So yeah, you know, we, we got smart in how to do that and made it, you know, so we got it down pretty quick and we can swap it out. <coughs> yeah, we don't. Oh, go ahead. You were telling me that, and you showed me earlier, that you don't leave the controls in there, obviously, right. because you have other students that are flying. So it's something you have to do each and every time you get the glider right. out. Right. So what you know, we do anyway with our students is we tend to do two flights in a row. Right? We have an hour limit on the trainers for, in the case of students, two flights or an hour. So if they get a 20-minute flight, they, can, they jump into a second flight right off the bat, and they can stay up for 40 minutes. If they come down after 20, they're done. So we throw it in. Bob does his two flights. We push it off to the side take the hand controls out, Bob gets himself situated, and it's ready to go for the next guy. Yeah. Every once in a while, uh, it's like every s four to six months, got to go find a lift and actually remember why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and you know, and, there's been days he gets one flight because he stays up for the hour. You know, we, yeah. we take advantage they, of it. They yelled us to come down right. the one time a couple weeks ago. Now you were flying before and having to drive, how long did you say you were having to drive? It's three and a half, uh, it's three hours to uh, Van Sant and four hours and 15 minutes to Belairstown. Because and those were the two places where I flew. They're the only other two that had hand controls yeah. before we got them. Right, absolutely. So then, In this area. So hopefully in the future we get the word out and other clubs can get the hand controls in these specially equipped aircraft to make it more possible it would certainly be an advantage um, that uh, there be more places and more people who could do it because uh, right now they're holding off on, I, I know, at least one person, possibly two, that would like to join. Nice. But they're holding off until 
we get everything situated because it's it's a learning process. We've been right. Um, You're the guinea pig, right? <laughs> I'm the guinea pig, and we've been. It's been a learning process, uh, figuring out how to make all this stuff work and how what's the best way to land, what's the best way to take off. And, and, and there's like there's some, I'll call them design issues and the way the controls are laid out. That I think we can see an improvement in, to where we can get the rudder just completely out of the loop. You know, Bob's relatively short, but. You know, somebody with longer legs without the use of them it. could get fouled into the rudder pedals. Yeah. I just right. barely clear them. Yeah. So we want Anybody to make sure taller than me it. would not be able to use yeah. that front uh, the way it's designed. Yeah, make sure it's not an issue where they, their feet right. get Right. I'm only 5'7", yeah. so uh, that's really cut the limit. Well, Glenn, I know you have to get back up in the air and go on another flight, so right. I'll let you go. I appreciate you joining us. You bet. Thanks for sticking around today and getting a chuckle watching us operate here and <laughs> seeing Bob getting in and out of that glider and going off and having his flight. Well, thank you for doing what you're doing for the people disabled. That is hey, that is awesome. No sweat. Yeah. Enjoy it. Thank you for putting it with me. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, if we can go back a little bit, I really would like to hear how your aviation story got started. <laughs> I was in the Army. I was a gazillion years ago. And I was wandering through a town in Germany little tiny town about four blocks square and uh, it was a bitter cold winter night and I was bundled up just wandering around seeing where I just landed and I smell this most god-awful horrible smell and being nothing else to do and being nosy let's go find out what's making this odor and I wandered down this little tiny side street down there was basically a hangar it was a glorified garage but it had a huge door the door is wide open it's about 10 degrees outside the door is wide open and then there's a half dozen young people in there doping a wing and fans blowing and everything and across the street are three or four older guys telling them what to do and how to do it and before the evening was done, I had shelled out my 20 marks and had become a member of the club and was doping a wing. I flew there. Um, it was LSV Landstuhl, one of the oldest clubs in the world, uh, 1928, I think. I know they celebrated their 85th because every now and then I wander around to their website. And they are still flying. They're still one of the oldest clubs in the world. And um, it was all winch launching at the time. And there was no tow planes or any of that stuff. I flew about 20, 25 flights there, and then I got hurt. Sent back to the U.S. They may not have even known what happened to me because I suddenly just did disappeared. And sent back to the United States, went to college, had a family, you know, the whole nine yards. Oh, yeah. And my wife died, and... Um, the um, kids are all grown, and it's just me and the cats, and I have unfinished business, so it was learn how to finish this, learning how to fly stuff. Yes, yeah, so let's go soaring, right? Let's go soaring. I have never in my wildest dreams had any desire to fly power, which is, you know, a lot of people think that's a little strange, but I've never had any desire to fly power. But darned, I like flying uh, sailplanes. Now, how did you find out about the Freedom's Wings? Well, Freedom's Wings advertises in um, one of the disability magazines that I get. It's, uh, it's called Sports and Spokes. Okay. Which is a recreation for people with disabilities, and it's a magazine that's exclusively disability, sports, and recreation. And saw it there, had a little time, and I was, okay, let's go find out what's going on. And went up there and um, flew with them for a number of years. The problem was rotating instructors. Every time I got an instructor, they moved or had a job change or something like that, and it was not very consistent. Yeah, that makes it tough. Um, it's great. To, I don't think I had a bad instructor. I just they, none of them were the same. Everybody yeah, right. had a different way of teaching. So it was like starting over again from scratch. Yeah, uh, every year. Then my most recent instructor, a guy named Dave Milner, said, knew about the, the club down here getting the glider and said, I've, my company just reassigned me to China. 
There's no way I can keep teaching. Uh, there's this guy named Glenn Miller down there, get, uh, Glenn Collins down there. Uh, why don't you get down there and it's a lot closer to where you live and go see if you can get him to teach you. Very cool. And like he, we said earlier, I showed up the day after the glider arrived. <laughs> you were on it. You I was on it. I was there. right on top of it. <laughs> and um, the glider arrived on Saturday and I showed up Sunday afternoon. And um, because it was late in the year and just the way the club's dues and everything were set up, I waited till January 1st to officially join. I f my first flight was 10 degrees out here, and we had to keep the vents open on the aircraft because the canopy would fog up if we closed them. Right. Oh, no. <laughs> so we are freezing our noogies off, but I was having a ball. <laughs> and uh, Glenn has been very patient. I am a um, very slow learner, and the aircraft had some problems and was out of commission for a couple of months. So uh, there were, it seems like there's been delays, delays, everything seems to be getting in the way. But um, finally got it straightened out and taken care of, and um, I've been flying just about every weekend, or coming up every weekend is available. Now, you were telling me earlier that there's, I believe you said there's only four aircraft that they're putting the special controls on. To the best of my knowledge, there are four aircraft that are class certified okay. by the FAA. Right, I got you. Um, that don't need special exemptions or anything like that. Okay. Don't have to be classified experimental uh, for flying with hand controls. And the ASK-21 is one of them, the Grogue 103 the duo discus and the discus cs and they all have to come from the factory with the at least the mounting hardware it built into the aircraft right uh they don't have to have the hand controls but they do have to have the mounting hardware for the hand controls built into the aircraft so if you want to add it later you can add it. if you can add it later but you have to make sure that's in there um there's a discus cs here at the airfield that i looked at and it was for sale, and I looked at it and looked at it, but it didn't have the mounting hardware, so there was no way I could put the hand controls in it. Right. And the ASK-21 is a very nice glider. It is a very nice glider. I don't think I've flown in a bad glider. I mean, the first one I flew was a K-4, which was the first one, the two-seater designed by Kaiser. Okay. And the ASK-21 was the last two-seater designed by Kaiser. So I I'm, I'm hit the lid first and last there of his go. aircraft. The... Um, Obviously, the, the K-4 was not accessible, uh, but the uh, Grove 103 was, and they're different, but they're the same. Uh, fortunately, everybody's got their act together, and the controls all move in the same direction. Yeah, right. So you're not going bass backwards. Moving the hand control to the rear is a right turn on all of them. Okay. It doesn't change. So when you pull it back. You pull it back for right. Yeah. Push it forward for left. And um, the um, spoilers have detents that lock it in place. It's when you move the spoiler, you move it and you lock it. Okay. So it's set and set and leave it. Different lock positions. It has different lock positions. And that is how you can use the rudder and the spoiler at the same time. You have to take your hand off the rudder, set the spoiler, then put your hand back on the rudder because they're both right next to each other. That is, took a little getting used to on the K-21 uh, because it was really stiff in the beginning. Yeah. And had trouble getting it into the detents and the locks. Now that it's worn in a little, it's nowhere near as difficult. So it's, it's getting better as you go and smoother it, and... I'm not sure whether it's getting better or I'm getting better, but one of the one of these are happening. I figure before I'm 800 years old, I'm going to have a green card in my pocket. <laughs> the important thing is you're learning, you're in the air, and that's awesome. It is awesome. If I get two weeks without flying, I begin to feel like my butt is too close to the ground and I need to get up in the air. I get that feeling too. I know what you're saying. That's <laughs> how, so, you know, got to get some air under my you know, under my dear air um, to, to feel well. 
And it's funny, I don't like to fly commercial. I rarely fly commercial. I do not like it. In fact, my degree is in transportation engineering, but it's railroads. Okay. Uh, I worked on the Amtrak high-speed line and stuff like that. So if you're not soaring, you'll take a train. I'll go get on a train. Yeah, I cro- <laughs> I've crossed the country by train. <laughs> it's uh, the only way, to f- only way to fly commercial. Um, I sort of want to, if I'm in the air, I want to drive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's uh, kind of... Uh, Kind of the way I am, I'm. I've always wanted to be in charge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try to be in charge, but I, I think my wife would uh, beg to differ on that one. <laughs> yeah, they. Um, yeah, been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have a wife anymore, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm glad that you're taking your time and getting back into a glider and flying. Uh, I am so thankful that they put up with me. Uh, here at Mid-Atlantic. Um, well, I don't think you're hard to put up with. I've been hanging out with you all day, and it's been an enjoyable day. Well, I've got you fooled anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's anything else... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bob, I appreciate you joining the podcast today. It's been great hanging out with you and great learning about this, and I think it is a awesome thing that Freedom's Wing does, and... I'm sorry to say I didn't know about it till recently, but I am definitely going to spread the word. I'm going to put a link in the show notes and the website, and we're going to get more people that don't know about it. Yeah, if you've and gone to their website. I've gone. I'm, uh, I'm going to put a link in there, and I'd like to see these other clubs get these gliders. Yeah, I was just having gliders. a long discussion with William Soaring because they are the demo for the new ASK-21B, and I had a long um back and forth with Rex out there about why don't you get one with hand controls. You just got to keep bugging him, right? Yeah, just keep bugging him. <laughs> I don't know whether it was successful or not. I don't know if I'll get to California to find out. <laughs> well, we're going to put the word out, and we got a lot of listeners in California, so they'll be hearing about it. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Okay. Thank you for joining us for another great guest and amazing story here on Soaring the Sky. You know, if you want to learn more about Freedom's Wings... Maybe you're disabled and would love to learn how to fly gliders, or maybe you just want to help out others and make a donation. You can find them online. It's freedomswings.org. Freedomswings.org. And if you want to check out pictures of Bob and his instructor, you can go to our website at soaringthesky.com. While you're online, we are on Instagram, Soaring the Sky Podcast, as well as Facebook. That's also Soaring the Sky Podcast. If you're a pilot and you want to share your story, please don't be shy. Feel free to send me an email, chuck at soaringthesky.com. I know you are listening all over the globe. We've heard from you, but we want to hear your story too. So like I said, don't be shy. Let us know. Drop us a line. Love to talk to you. The SSA.org is another great site. If you want to learn how to fly gliders, you want to find out where to go in your area, you can do that there. They have some great webinars on there. A lot of things to learn right there at ssa.org. Thank you for joining us right here on Soaring the Sky. I hope to catch you back next time for another great guest on Soaring the Sky.